children. Hello, everybody. I'm Sam. Welcome to today's online field trip where we're going to teach you everything you've always wanted to know about wrinkly raisins. Now, meet Debbie. She's our first expert for today. Hello, Hello. Debbie. Hello. We're going to meet our second expert, Jonathan, a little later on in this online field trip. But first of all, as you can see, we're here today at a raisin packing factory. We're actually in Northamptonshire, which is in the middle of the country. And right now we're surrounded by around 20 million packets of dried fruit, which has come from all over the world, around 15 countries. That's pretty amazing, isn't it, it Debbie? It is, phenomenal number, very good, yeah. Great stuff. Now give us a wave and a cheer in your classrooms, children, if you're looking forward to learning all about wrinkly raisins today. <laughs> Great stuff. So that's St Cuthbert's Primary there. They're very excited to learn Great. all about Great. it. So Debbie, what are we going to learn? Today we're going to be learning about raisins, what they are and how they are made. We're also going to be learning about why and how we preserve food and also what other foods can we use raisins in. Really, really good stuff. Well, let's meet our schools. We have heard them. We've seen them wave. Let's go to St Cuthbert's Primary now, first of all. They're in Cumbria and it's actually Mrs Robinson's class that's taking part today. <laughs> Nice and loud over there at St Cuthbert's. Let's go over to Waterloo Primary now. They're in Lancashire and it's Miss Jones's class. Hello, everybody. Hi. Great stuff. We're going to stay in Lancashire now. We're going to go over to Mrs Plackett's class. They're in Ravenshead Primary. Hello, everybody. Hi. Lots of fabulous smiley faces there. And finally, let's go to Clown Infants in Derbyshire where Miss Barnett's class is taking part. Hello everybody! Yeah. It's great to have you all with us, nice and loud as well, very keen to learn, so let's start learning. Uh, first of all Debbie, whereabouts are we? Today we are in our finished goods warehouse, surrounded by over 20 million packets of different fruits from all over the world, from countries like China, America, Chile, South Africa, um, fruits varying from apples, pineapples, coconuts, raisins, sultanas. That's a lot of fruit, so I'm guessing this place is quite big. From what I can see so mm -hmm. far, it is huge. This warehouse is that big that you can actually fit 10 football pitches inside this warehouse. Wow, so one football pitch, children, if you can imagine, that is big enough. Mm. But 10, 10 football pitches yes. inside here. It's very big. So first of all, as I said, we're learning about raisins. So what is a raisin? A raisin is literally a grape that has been left out in the sun to dry for about three weeks. Wow, and what type of grapes are used to make raisins? So the type of grape is called is the white grape. It's actually the green grape that you get from the supermarket and it's called the Thompson seedless variety. Um, there's a difference between a raisin, a sultana and a currant. So a raisin is a white grape naturally dried in the sun for three weeks. Right. A sultana is using the same grape but then dipped in a special solution to speed up the drying process. And a currant is using the black Corinth grape which again is naturally dried in the sun. Wow, so they're all, they're all quite different then. So where yes. are the grapes grown? I'm guessing we don't grow many in the UK. We do grow a few in the UK, but we don't really have the ideal climate to be, uh, produce many grapes. So these grapes come from California, and California grow uh, loads and loads of grapes. Um, and the reason why they grow loads of grapes in California is because the weather is so hot and sunny that it helps the, the grapes be able to dry out and turn into raisins. Of course, we do need the sunshine. So yes. um, how, do, how did people realise that leaving grapes out in the sunshine um, turns to turn grapes into raisins? Well, grapes goes back to prehistoric times and they actually originated and came from the Middle East. And basically, the, the raisins were just discovered really on a vine that was, had just been left to dry, so the raisin had just been left on the vine to dry. Um, and production by humans dates back by at least 3,000 years. Wow, so it's kind of by an accident. I love that. Yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so why did people then start drying them? Well, this day and age, you can eat what you want, when you want, because mm -hmm. you can grow things in greenhouses or you can Im we can import them from warmer countries. Historically, it hasn't always been that way. Um, so they've, they've had to buy fresh fruit and vegetables at the time when it was in season. And they've had to find a way of storing the products to last them through the winter time when there is no season around. Oh, it's so clever. We're learning so much. Thank you so much, Debbie. But I do know that our schools have been learning all about raisins before today's online field trip, using all the resources that we do have online to help you learn. Um, so I'd love to find out what St Cuthbert's has learned so far before today. Do we have someone there, Mrs Robinson? Can we find out your favourite fact about raisins you've learned? Hello, my name's Rosa. Did you know that half of the world's raisins come from California? 
Great stuff. So, so St Cuthbert's Primary have learned that half the world's raisins come from California. It's at least half. It might even be nearer 80% come from California. And that is, again, because of their perfect climate for that. Great. Really, really good learning, St Cuthbert's. Let's go over to Waterloo Primary now. Do we have someone there, Miss Jones, who can tell us what you've learned? Hi, I'm Jackson. And... Um, Great and raisins are grapes that have been dried out. That's really great. So Waterloo Primary have found out that raisins are actually grapes that are just drying out. That's correct. Absolutely, yes. Are you impressed with the learning so very, far? Very, very impressed. Well done. Good work. <laughs> great stuff. It's time to learn out, learn some more now. And this is all about how we dry food in order to preserve it. Enjoy. Drying food to preserve it. Today. Most of us are lucky enough to have fridges in our homes to keep our food nice and fresh. But have you ever wondered how people kept food fresh before we had electricity to power fridges? Well, for people living in very cold places, such as the Inuit people, who have lived in the Arctic for thousands of years, keeping their food fresh was easy, because the temperature outside was almost always below freezing. Just like living in one big fridge freezer, but people living in the rest of the world had to think of other ways to preserve their food, as warmer weather makes it hard to keep food fresh for very long. Luckily, the sun provided the perfect solution. People discovered that if they laid their harvest out in the sun's hot rays, it would dry, which meant their food stayed edible for much longer. This is because drying food removes the water by evaporating it, which means that bacteria and mould can't grow, as both need moisture to live on. Removing moisture and drying the food we grow is one of the oldest known ways of preserving food. And did you know that fruits aren't the only produce that people can dry to preserve? It's common in lots of countries around the world for fishermen to dry the fish they catch. And other foods, such as meat, can also be dried. Popular products you might have heard of are Parma ham from Italy and beef jerky from the United States of America. Sometimes when meat and fish are dried to preserve them, they have salt added, which helps to draw out any moisture. Some foods can also be smoked, which means that the food is laid over smoking wood timbers like this to dry it out. This process adds a nice smoky flavour. See if you can think of any other foods that might have been dried to preserve them. There are lots you might not even realise are dried. Foods like cereals for breakfast, noodles, the tea and tea bags, rice, pasta, and many, many more. Lots of things we regularly eat. Since humans discovered that drying food is a way of preserving it, we have developed lots of other clever ways to prevent it from spoiling too quickly, including pickling, freezing, and canning. Preserving our food means that we avoid wasting it. And it also means that even when the harvest is over, we still have lots of food to enjoy all year round. Welcome back children. We hope you enjoyed that video. Give us a wave and a cheer in your classrooms if you did. Now I'm joined by our second expert, this is Jonathan who's the technical manager here. Hello Jonathan. Hi Sam, hi children. Now I really enjoyed that video Jonathan. One thing that struck me is the fact that so many foods are dried to preserve them and I didn't realise I've got most of them in my store cupboard at home and I go in there if I'm going to bake or cook something and I've sort of been taking it for granted that they stay fresh for so long and we have some of them here don't we? I can see we've got the raisins and the currants here but what are some of the other things that we have Jonathan? We do have, so if you, if you see on the table here we've got what you'd see as a nice juicy apricot and then the dried variety here. Uh, so that is just the same thing that just has had the water is, taken out of it? The moisture taken out yes wow. and then again we've got nice juicy apple and a dried apple again moisture taken out. And that will just last I mean that in a fruit bowl will last how long? Yeah in a, a fruit weeks? bowl maybe a week maybe and then in a packet in your in your cupboard, maybe this will last six months. Wow, so there's a lot more life. That's on great, it. yeah. Now I recognise these. I think that a lot of our children would uh, have these for their tea, perhaps. They would. So here we've got both sides of it. So you've got your dried dried beans here, 
which are then rehydrated back into your baked beans that you'll have with your, with your dinner in okay. the evenings. Okay, so they've been dehydrated to, to this and then rehydrated to make baked beans. That's right, yes. Oh, very clever indeed. And this is my favourite. I absolutely love popcorn, but how do we go from this to this, Jonathan? Yes, so you've got your corn, which will be in the fields, um, and this is what you'd see growing. It's then dried, mostly in the field, but then in, then in uh, warehouses afterwards, checked for its... Uh, its quality and its moisture levels and then this is what you would see either in the cinema or if you're lucky enough you might do this at home uh, making popcorn. Yeah I do that at home with my daughter she really loves it. Now yeah. is all this sort of dried the same way in the sun like the the raisins Jonathan? It's not no there's different ways of drying food so you've got the raisins and the apricots which are dried off the uh, vine and off the plant on the floor in the sun mm -hmm. but then you've got the apples that are harvested in the field in the in the orchards mm -hmm. uh, a processed cut and cored and then oven dried to to pull out all the moisture uh, with the beans again they they are dried in the pods in the fields where they're grown and then just harvested from there okay and how about the corn on the cob they take quite a while don't they they do. Um, it, it depends how you process them, but you can take up to a year. Um, wow. But most now do it do it slightly different, so it's, it's, it's speeded up from that. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So why do we need to take most of the, as much water out as possible to, oh. to keep them fresh? Okay. Yeah, so we take out the moisture. Uh, as we briefly discussed earlier, if you keep a, a grape or any of the fruit mm -hmm. uh, fresh in a bowl, uh, it's not likely it's going to last more than a week. Uh, if you take the moisture out of it, you're, pre you're preventing the bacteria from growing, preventing mould from developing and making your food go off. Um, so it will last much longer. Great. So it means we don't have to keep going to the supermarket to buy all these things. We can keep them in our store cupboard. We can. Mm. Fabulous yeah. stuff. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about dehydrating um, raisins and fruit here, but you do rehydrate fruit here as well, don't you? We do, yes. Uh, we, we blanch fruit here uh, where we basically, and you can see a video on screen now, uh, of our factory. So here you see apricots being placed into hot water around 80, 85 degrees. That'll stay in there for around three minutes uh, time when they'll pull them out and the fruit will be nice and juicy and soft. So it just makes them nicer to eat. So they've just been plumped up with water. So when you bite into them, they, they feel a little bit more sort of fleshy. Yeah, so before you do that, they're, 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 they're a bit tougher and they're for cooking with um, so that the moisture goes in in the cooking process. So those ones are ones that are ready to eat, ah, nice and juicy. Fascinating. Mm. Well, I know that our children have been learning all about dehydration and rehydration this week in their classrooms with a really simple experiment. Um, and I'd love to know how you got on. So let's go to St Cuthbert's Primary. And I'm wondering if someone in Mrs Robinson's class um, can tell me what you actually did with the experiment. Hello, my name is Cordy, and yesterday we looked at some raisins and put them in a tub and pour the water in and left them overnight and in the morning we came and had a look at the raisins and they got fatter and less wrinkled on them. That sounds great. So what they did, Jonathan, they left the raisins in water overnight and when they came back into school the next day they were much bigger. Yes, well yeah, that's it and that's what we, a simplified version of what we do in our factory. So for raisins we will put place them into hot water, plump them up and make them ready for snacking on. Uh, let's go over to Waterloo Primary now. Miss Jones's class, can someone tell me um, some of the apparatus that you use to do this experiment? Uh, hello, my name is Christopher and we use wrinkly raisins and a glass of water. So Christopher used raisins, a glass and some water. Okay. You use a bit more machinery here, yeah, don't you, we, Jonathan? As you saw in that video, we've got machinery, we've got really hot water and baskets which move and vibratory uh, conveyors to move the fruit along. So, but yeah. really great work, Waterloo Primary. Let's go to Raymondsfield Primary now. Would it be possible to see your raisin? There's lots and lots of raisins in there. So they're, they're so much bigger, aren't they? they you can are, just yes. tell they've just actually really expanded full of water. Yeah, so they're, they're taking on that moisture and getting a bit bigger. Well done. Let's finally go over to Clown Infant School now. Can we find out what Miss Barnett's class have concluded from doing the experiment? The raisins soaked the water and they floated. And they floated. 
That's really great. So clown infants have uh, concluded from doing the experiment that the raisin soaked up the water and they actually started to float. Ah, lovely. Made them more yeah. buoyant in the water. Mm. Children, you have done an amazing job with this week's experiment. Congratulations. And we really hope you enjoyed it. Time to learn a little bit more now. And this is a short video all about raisins and how they make their journey from farm to fork. Raisins from farm to fork. Did you know that a raisin starts life as a juicy grape? They grow in hot, dry climates, such as here in California, in the United States of America. The vines like to grow in dry, sandy soil and need plenty of sunshine and water to produce plump and juicy grapes. The established vines start life as small plants. They are planted in the ground in rows like this. Once the vines are established, they next produce what we call a bloom. It looks like this. So long as it's pollinated, each tiny flower will over time ripen and become a grape. And it takes one whole year before the vines can start to produce grapes ready for harvest. Once harvest time arrives, the grower examines the grapes using a refractometer. He checks the sweetness of the grapes, and only once he is satisfied that they are sweet and fully ripe does the harvest begin. To harvest the grapes, they use a machine like this. It moves between the rows of vines and shakes the grapes free. Next, they are laid out on this brown paper to dry naturally in the hot Californian sun. Once collected, they go along a conveyor belt and then into a lorry like this. It can take around four to five days for the grapes to dry out, turning from green to brown. Grapes lose so much water that they shrink to a quarter of their original size. That's like a large bull elephant shrinking to the size of a gorilla. Once the raisins have dried, they are collected and taken to the pack house. Here they are washed and packed before being shipped to the United Kingdom for the next stage of their journey. The raisins travel across the Atlantic Ocean by ship. Before arriving into a UK port, once here, they are taken to this packing factory in Northamptonshire to start the final part of their journey. The raisins are tipped onto a conveyor belt like this so that they can be thoroughly washed once more before being weighed and packed into bags. Finally, this metal detecting machine gives them one last check before they are placed on a pallet and wrapped, ready to be sent to the shops for you to buy and enjoy. Welcome back children, we hope you enjoyed that video. Give us a wave and a cheer in your classrooms if you did. Yay, Waterloo Primary certainly did. Now, as you can see, I'm joined by both our experts. We've got Debbie back with us. We've still got Jonathan. Jonathan, I loved that video there. I love seeing the, uh, the raisins sort of bobbling along the conveyor belt. There mm. seem to be thousands there. There is, uh, we process around 100 tonnes a day. Uh, of raisins through our factory and that equates to the weight of about 5,000 of you children. Wow, 5,000 children. That's a lot. Mm. <laughs> we should put that to the test and do a little <laughs> experiment at some point. Uh, a lot of children. Um, and Debbie, you have some really tasty looking food in front of you here. Why do we have these here? So I just wanted to show all the different things that you can do with raisins. So ah. it's, a lot of people just think that you can use it as a snack in between meals, but it's not the case. You can use it, you know, for, for starters with your breakfast. So in different home bakery products, um, you can add lots of different fruits and raisins and sultanas into different cereals and porridges and things like that. There's also cereal bars that have raisins incorporated in it but not only breakfast you can also have it as your main meal so you, you can put ra um, raisins in curries. It's so amazing when you have a curry and then yes. you kind of you bite into a raisin you're like what's that? Absolutely. You're not expecting yes. something yeah. fruity but it actually does add to it the does flavour work, doesn't, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes. Um, and also you can put it in tagines as well and risottos so you know you can't just think of raisins on its own it's such a versatile <laughs> fruit. Um, you can you can have it in yogurts and also in salads also as well so there are so many different things rather than just treating it as a little snack. The one thing that I remember having it in as well and actually was quite surprised was a goat cheese 
cheese salad. So it was yes. a salad, it had yeah. obviously everything you'd have in a normal salad. Yeah. And then something about having the raisins and the goat's cheese together yeah. that really complemented yes. the, the flavour. I guess we normally yeah. have, oh, in a lot of kind of places, you can have grapes and cheese, can't you? Yes, absolutely. So it's yep. the same as having raisins and cheese. It was yeah. so delicious. Yeah. And I think actually if the children, perhaps when they get home, um, could give it a go, putting different yes, raisins absolutely. into different things and yep. see what it tastes like. Some, you, know, might, you might put it into something and it might not work at all, but I think yeah. that most things it would work. It does, it, does. it works really it? well. Yes, definitely. Yeah, they're very, very tasty. And of course, children, it's important to remember that raisins are a source of potassium, manganese, copper, iron, and vitamin B6, which we need for healthy hair, healthy skin, and healthy eyes as well. Well, we've come to the end of this online field trip almost, guys. We're almost running out of time. Just enough time to get some questions for you, because I think that our children probably have things that they still want to clear up. So let's go over to St Cuthbert's Primary. Does Mrs Robinson's class have any questions for our experts? Hi, I'm Tosi. Why are raisins brown and not re red, green and black like grapes? That's a really good question. So why are raisins brown and not green and red or black like grapes, Jonathan? Okay, well, they're, they're brown due to the, uh, the sugar in the fruit caramelising when they're drying on the ground. Really good, really good question. Let's go over to uh, Waterloo Primary now. Hello, I'm Cara and I'd like to ask how many fruit and vegetables do you grow in your farm? Let's find out for you. So Jonathan, perhaps you could tell us how many fruit and vegetables do you grow here? Uh, on this site we don't actually grow anything, um, we buy and purchase all of our products from around the world as we've said earlier. Well, yeah, I think 15 different countries. Yes, yeah, 15 different yeah. countries here children, um, but nothing's actually grown here, I can vouch for that. <laughs> I've had a look around, I haven't found anything growing. Really great question though. Mm. Let's go over to Ravensfield Primary now. What kind of weather helps raisins to grow and how do they get to taste so nice? Debbie, you'll be able to answer that. And um, so what kind of weather do we need to grow uh, grapes and, and raisin and, and turn them into raisins? And why do raisins taste so nice? Okay. <laughs> grapes need a lot of sunshine, which is why they grow in California, which is why they grow so many. And the sun helps them really plump up and get lots really, really juicy. So they need really hot, sunny weather, which is why California is the perfect climate for that. Really great question, children. Let's get our final question. Let's go over to clown infants. My name is Matthew and um, my question is, why aren't raisins called raisins? That is a really good question, Matthew. So Matthew would like to know, why are raisins called raisins? Very knowledgeable. Did you know that, children? Give me a wave and a cheer in your classrooms if you knew that uh, raisins were the French word for grape. Yay! Oh, they already knew. They already knew. And um, thank you so much, both of you. One final question from me. Um, what's your favourite part of your job? Um, I love being able to go around all the different countries to see the, grow, uh, the fruit actually growing and seeing it actually harvesting and seeing the people that actually do the the growing of the fruit and the collecting of the fruit. That sounds like a really, really great job, Debbie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've yes. got a great job. Um, how about you, Jonathan? It's not quite as exotic, but uh, <laughs> I really enjoy making sure that all the products that we produce here get to the retailers in a, the best condition they can and to to your homes. Yeah, well, we appreciate it, Jonathan. I'm sure all the children do appreciate it as well. I'm afraid we've run out of time today, children. Um, but if you'd like to uh, sign up for a farm to fork trail, uh, you can do that for your school. It's really simple to do. You just need to get online on our website. Uh, and once you're on there, the process is simple. And it's really fun, just like the kids that you can see on the screen right now. They're getting really stuck in. So make sure you do do that if you haven't done that already. But from myself and Debbie and Jonathan here in uh, the factory here today, it's goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking part, St Cuthbert's. Thank you so much, Waterloo Primary. Great to have Miss Jones's class taking part today. Let's go up to Ravensfield Primary now and say goodbye. Thank you, children. And finally, let's go over to Clown Infants. Thank you so much for taking part again, children.
And if you'd like to take part in our next online field trip, you can learn all about marvellous Marmite, one of the nation's favourite spreads. Uh, so pop that in your diary. And don't forget, we've got lots of these online field trips on our website, ready for you to watch and loads of great resources for you to download and learn about all different types of food as well. So make